You don't have a marketing problem. You don't have a sales problem. You don't have a CS problem. You don't even have a product problem. We believe every company has a go-to-market problem. Today on the pod is Go to Market with CEO of GTM Partners, Sangram Vadre, where we discuss how to communicate your unique value proposition to prospects and customers. And then, of course, in the first segment is my weekly check in with editor in chief of the B newsletter, Marty Beckerman. We talk about business travel, workplace conflict, and the salad dressing that has given 600 million bucks and counting to charity. Hey, Marty, how are you? Good to see you. Doing great, John. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, excited to talk to you again this week about what's going on in the newsletter. Um, So let's start first talking about air travel. Um, On a personal note, I know you have a nine-month-old. Have you taken her on any airplanes? Uh, She has been on one trip, and we were really pleasantly surprised. (laughs) After having been on airplanes my whole life, hearing screaming babies, apparently I was a screaming baby on the airplane. (laughs) Uh, some might say I'm still a screaming baby. Uh, our daughter was, uh, totally calm the whole trip pretty much. So, uh, hopefully that continues at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Nice. Nice. One of the, one of the things that I've noticed about air travel, uh, this, this year, cause really picked up for me, both personal and business is how packed the airports are. I mean, it's, it's like really striking. They're busier than I've ever, ever seen. You know, I'm, I'm almost yearning for the days when, when, uh, I'm not yearning for a pandemic. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't cancel me, but, um, but I, you know, I was yearning for a pandemic for years because I thought it would bring down housing prices, but then they just went up. So, yeah, you know. yeah. But, I, but back, back when air, airports, you could get around, there wasn't a super long late, uh, you know, line every Starbucks and so on. But what you're covering is that business travel is going to go way up next year, even compared to what's going on this year. Right. Um, according to the Global Business Travel Association, uh, eight in 10 company travel managers are saying that they're booking more uh, business trips next year than this year. The head of Omni Hotels is saying that there's going to be a 20% increase next year in um, conferences and team building uh, uh, events. So um, there's been kind of a trend of the last few years of revenge travel uh, this idea that after we were all in lockdown and not leaving our houses, um, not seeing the world, not seeing friends and family, people had a lot of savings built up uh, and they were going to spend that on personal travel. So it seems like 2024 is uh, going to be the year that business travel finally catches up with that trend. Now, what type of business travel is is happening? Is it is it that just people are working remotely, they're coming into the office or is it other things? Right. Well, we talked to um, we talked to an expert in this who talked about the kind of business travel that um, that employees will be most likely to go along with. Uh, you know, companies are struggling to get employees back in the office uh, even a few days a week, so to get them on an airplane and packing their toiletries uh, could be a big ask. But um, this business expert told us uh, for uh, business travel with a really strong purpose. Um, Things like sales meetings with customers or prospects, customer service trips, um, trade shows, industry events, where it's things where your company really needs to be there in person, where this could not be a Zoom meeting is is the most important thing. That makes sense. Um, You're also covering next week the the what happens when there are conflicts in the workplace. And I was kind of shocked by the stat that 50% of a manager's time is spent managing conflict. That that sounds you know, counterproductive to what, to what most businesses are trying to achieve. Yeah. What did, not my manager's you, time. I'm yeah. easy to get along with. Right. Me, me too. Um, uh, at least at work. Uh, so what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you learning? Um, and what'd you write about? Right. Um, we are doing an ex an excerpt from the book, work your magic, uh, from an organizational consultant named, uh, Sharon Dormari. And she, uh, she is talking about how workplace conflict is inevitable. Every company is going to have employees or departments or executives that have different visions for things. Um, what she says is the most important thing is that this needs to be out in the open. Mm-hmm. Uh, then there needs to be ground rules. 
for it, uh, that it's not going to become a game of people talking behind each other's backs and mm-hmm. gossiping and going to their manager and saying, I can't stand this person. Um, she's saying that if you have a problem with how someone's doing something, you need to talk with them directly and work something out and come to a compromise that when it's behind people's backs, it creates this toxic gossip culture that can actually destroy a company. Yeah. And I, I found in my own personal situation, when there's some type of professional disagreement, there's almost like when it comes to light, there's a, there's a catharsis and it almost always, always gets better. So that, that makes sense. Um, last thing I wanted to touch on is you have a cool, um, I guess, recurring feature called origin story, uh, in, in the newsletter, what company are you covering this time around? Sure. Uh, we're talking about Newman's own and how Newman's own got off the ground. Um, today with, uh, there's so many celebrities that have tequila brands or canned wine, uh, and partnerships, uh, with watch companies. Um, Ryan Reynolds is very, very, very good at this. He owns a cell phone company. Um, Mm -hmm. so, uh, they're becoming billionaires. A lot of these celebrities are actually making way more money on, um, their business ventures than on their acting or singing and, uh, good for them. But we're talking about how Newman Zone started. Um, it wasn't originally supposed to be a business venture at all. Uh, Paul Newman would make the salad dressing, uh, for dinner guests. He'd have his friends over and he'd serve them a uh, salad and other dishes. And everyone pointed to the salad dressing. He's like, that's the best salad. I, that's the, that's, that's the one hell of a salad dressing there, Paul. Uh, you should sell that. It's all, you got to sell that in stores. And he heard the eighties so were t- simpler times. Huh? Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so he was finally was like, okay, I'll put it in stores, but I don't, I don't need any more money. I'm going to give away every penny, uh, that the salad dressing makes. And that expanded into the whole line of Newman's own, uh, products, um, pizzas and jarred tomato sauce and, uh, dozens and dozens of products that have raised $600 million, uh, since 1982 for, um, Things like uh, underserved children, children with chronic uh, chronic diseases, really good causes. Um, so he was kind of doing the corporate responsibility thing way before it was cool, and it all came from just putting some balsamic on uh, on some mixed greens. Yeah, it's a cool story, amazing story, and it's not one percent of you know net proceeds to charity. It's everything to charity. Six hundred million, a really big deal. And my plug would be the Fig Newmans. So they're like, you know, the uh, Fig Newtons kind of, but Newman's own version. They also make a gluten-free one. I have two folks in my family who are gluten-free. They're really delicious. So uh, buy some of that and give some money back to these charities. I'll check them out. I'll, 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 it's not Girl Scout cookie season, so maybe that'll hold us over. Okay. All right. Good. Good to see you, Marty. Thanks. Talk to you next right. week. Thanks a lot, John. Hi, Sangram. How are you? Good to see you. Great to see you, John. I'm especially after we meeting up in New York and seeing an event, doing things together. I feel like, all right, I, we now know each other well, so we can go deep on some of these topics. Totally. And and what's so cool about New York? You live you live in Atlanta, I think. I live in Seattle. Um, there's there's always something monumental going on in New York. I mean, last last week was UN week. Not yeah. not great for traffic exactly, but but really cool. And there's always something about the creative energy in person yeah. in New York that's really hard to, to replicate. It is. It's a fun. The only thing I feel semi not great about is the speed at which people walk in New York. It immediately mm. reminds me that I live in a suburb in Johns Creek in Atlanta and I'm walking slow and everybody's passing me by like really fast. So New York reminds me of the speed at which everybody's moving. Yeah, I was going through I I took the um I took the subway when I was when I was there and I like wasn't fast enough to tap my phone when I was going through the the turnstiles. Yeah. <laughs> like people yeah. were like queuing behind me. They I got some dirty looks. So yeah, pe- <laughs> people are moving fast there no no question. So um so I'm so pumped to talk to you today and and I kind of want to tee it up tee it up this this way. So like let let's say you have uh, a solid product. Most of the listeners have a solid product or service. You have some customers that like it. You believe in it. You think it drives real value, but you're not growing. So it, with the old narrative, 
was to say, oh, you've got a problem with sales. Yeah. Uh, or, or you have a problem with marketing. But that's not what you say. So, so Sangram, what would you characterize as the issue? Uh, we have T-shirts with that now. It literally okay. says, uh, you don't have a marketing problem. You don't have a sales problem. You don't have a CS problem. You don't even have a product problem. We believe every company has a go-to-market problem. And John, as, as, as you and I experienced in, in New York when we did this event was, everybody recognizes that a single department or a single function can never solve an entire company problem. And, and, and an example of, of this company that you just shared, well, maybe the solution to that problem is that you need to win a different market. Maybe you need to create a different type of product that might be easy to do. Maybe you need to run a completely different go-to-market motion. Instead of outbound, you need to do PLG. Whatever it might be, it is a team decision. It requires marketing, sales, customer success, and product team to come together and solve it in a way that are thinking about it as a business. And, and I think the way to frame it is, okay, we got a go-to-market problem. Let's figure out how to solve it together. So... Um you, you talk to dozens, hundreds of, of companies sort of experiencing the highs and lows of growing a business. And you, you yourself have, have experienced some real rocket ships like at, at, at Pardot. When you think at, at the highest, highest level of like top performing organizations and, um, and have really, whether or not they've solved it, it, it's good. It's top of the line. What are some of the characteristics that you see just to get the, the yeah. ball rolling here? Yeah. I think, I think. I think there is a, a, a part that is not talked about much, and I've experienced it so much in my, my career. Um, it, I think the top performing companies typically have a team that I call is built of dreamers, doers, and drivers. Mm. People don't think about it in that sense. So, so how many times, John, you may have hired somebody who is on paper amazing, came with highly recommended folks and said, oh, this person is amazing. He's the best person, seen that, done that, all that. And you hired them and all of a sudden, a week later, you're like, I don't think this is working out. I don't think I got the right person. And I've had, this has happened to me multiple times. And the reason was because I hired for the skill set, not for the mindset. Mm. And every stage of the business, every way the business are built, you need to hire people in a certain functions at, for the stage as well. So if it's, a, if it's a new department where everything is new, regardless of big, small, but if it's a new thing, you need a dreamer. You need somebody who loves chaos, who can say, all right, I'll come in. I don't need a process. I'm just going to figure things out. Right? You need that. So, so that's a dreamer mindset. A driver is someone when you need a department, you're like, all right, they're just not moving fast enough. They just are not on the ball as much as they should. So you need a driver there who's, who recognizes and has a sense of urgency around certain things. And, and that's when you know that things are moving faster. And then most organization, almost 80% are made up of doers who are ultimately the people you can trust that these people are going to get things done. They're going to get things done on time. They're going to look at all the details. They're going to make a phenomenal, do a phenomenal job of it. And the combination of a great company or a great team is this dreamer, doer, driver combination. Uh, and and if, because if you have too many dreamers, guess what? Everybody's dreaming. Nothing is getting done. Uh, if you too, have too many doers, everybody's just getting th trying to get things done, but they don't know where they're going. And if you have drivers, they're just killing each other because they're like, why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? So you need this amazing combination of dreamer to a driver. And I feel most amazing companies that I have worked with as, at, at Pardot, at Salesforce, at Terminus, and now even at go-to-market partners, to me, that's what I'm looking for. And that's what drives these businesses forward. That's a great way of thinking about it. So if you're, if you're a leader hearing, hearing this and, um, and that should you start by thinking across your team and saying, okay, uh, S Sally, she's, you know, she's my dreamer. Um, Bob, he's my doer at, at, et cetera. Is that how to think of, how to think yeah. about it in one way to see what your gaps are? Yeah, I think the best way, you, you would know it. I think most people, as soon as I said those words, it mm -hmm. probably popped in their brain. Like, okay, I think I'm a dreamer. I think I'm a doer. Oh, I know where my problems are. Because when you're hiring, it's hard to do, oh, I'm going to do a disk profile of somebody. <laughs> you know, you're not doing right. that. You, you need that for more depth, in-depth understanding of how to work. But ultimately, you need to know immediately as a hiring person, as a, as a company that is scaling or moving fast, is like, what do I need? So the first question you need to ask to yourself as a leader, who do I need on my team right now for this particular job? Not skill set, 
but mindset wise. And as soon as you ask that question, it's immediate most times for people, okay, I, I need somebody who's going to walk into this chaos and say, hallelujah, this is awesome. I'm here for a reason. This is what I want to do. Versus somebody who looks at that and saying, whoa, you got problems. I don't know how you're going to solve for it. You don't need that person. You, the, you know, <laughs> totally. That's the last person you want in that. You want a person who looks at a problem and jump in and that's a dreamer. But sometimes when you're scaling and the departments are working fine, sometimes you need a doer leader because you just want to make sure things are done and you don't need to move things too, too much over there. You just want to make sure things are done right because that's what's needed over there. So all are leadership roles, but you need to know what mindset you're hiring for at what time. I, re I really like that, and I think that it reminds me of of how a Amazon approaches hiring in that they have these uh, leadership principles. I don't know how many they they have anymore, but when you're hiring at at Amazon, you're sort of thinking, does this person need to think big? Does this person need to dive yeah. deep? Does this person need to invent and simplify? And so it's a way of of sorting among candidates, all who have the same experience, but might bring a a uh, special superpower to totally. the table to the table that that someone doesn't. I, I really think that's a good way good way of thinking about it, and also prepping you know, the interview panel about how to think about what you're looking for be, beyond. You know, they also worked at a platform company, and they also have had a marketing title and 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 whatever. That, that's really cool. So, um, a, a lot of what what we went through in in New York and what I'm excited to to kind of work on within within my team is how GTM strategy can be improved. And I, I liked I liked the audacity that you have on on your site about saying there are 15 problems <laughs> in, in the GTM world. There are exactly 15. There are only 15. <laughs> like, um, I want to actually go through, go through some of these because they're really yeah. interesting to talk about. But, but how did you arrive on this, on this journey of looking at like specific problems? within someone's GTM strategy and then how, how to diagnose and correct those. Oh, man, it's a fun story, John. When we wrote, Brian and I wrote the book Move, we started asking go-to-market questions to Brian Halligan, who was the CEO of HubSpot at that time, to Mark Robert from Stage to Capital, to a ton of marketers like Megan Eisenberg and Sydney Sloan, and VC who has had 200 exits like Kelly Ford um, and others. And we kept asking questions, who owns go-to-market? How do you think about go-to-market? What go-to-market problems are you struggling? with that then all these questions it came down to these very clear patterns that people started to do and then we did drop the research and saying all right let's look at how do these patterns emerge and we then ran through 3,000 or so go-to-market leaders and uh, uh, over and over we just saw these 15 come back we never saw a 16th one come back at all. And so when we saw that, oh, there is there are literally a finite number of problems. Now, you you may say it a little bit differently and, and different companies say it differently. We try to take the jargon off. Like all these 15 problems are literally what some people say, well, you know, a board meeting yesterday, because that's what we talked about. So we know these words actually connect emotionally. These are real words, real people use in their companies to solve and think about problems. But the challenge that everybody faces is they never look at this as a go-to-market problem. They look at this as, oh, churn is killing my business? That's a customer success problem. Oh, we don't have enough leads? Oh, that's a marketing problem. That's where it breaks down. That's when you have just forgotten the point we are here. We're here to solve go-to-market problems, not a functional problem. It, 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 that's where it breaks down completely. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's because you have shared responsibility for, for things need to look at things hol holistically like like a pipeline or or yeah. whatever so I want to I want to dive deeper on on three of the problems and sort of whether you've had personal experience with these or if you have advised companies from these or how you think about them so one that I found really really interesting was the GTM problem of business is relying on heroic sales players but not sales plays. And I, I've seen this a lot, whether it's um, a, a startup that I'm, I'm working on or a startup that I'm close to, where you've got two or three folks and or maybe the founder who cut the first big deal and it's amazing. And they cut the second big deal and it's, it's amazing. And we say, okay, we've got two big deals. It's driving revenue. Now we need 30. Yeah. And then you're trying to scale the sales team and like, it like doesn't work. And, and so you're, you're trying to 
find like how do you capture this this magic? So may, maybe you can talk about this problem as you've seen it and why you put it. May, maybe there's a reason why you put it number one in it, terms of the list of problems. It certainly has been. So even for for every single, we've done ton, 10 go-to-market roadshows by now. And every time we run it, that happens to be one of the top three go-to-market problems that come up. So it, you're absolutely right. There's a reason why it's number one there. Uh, it's not saying that this is the most important problem, but it is the most common problem that most companies face. Um, and, and if you talk about, let's just take, take let's, let's segment this. Let's just say you, it's an early stage. The problem that you described, John, is exactly that. As a founder-led sales, they know how to do it. They're so unclear about the problem they're solving. They're selling through passion and energy and excitement for it. And people are going to give it a shot if they know enough about you and all that. And that works. And that is not sales. That is pure heroics at that point. And, and we want, people should not consider that as a, oh, we got a product market fit. Not true at all. But at the same time, what has changed, John, you and I have experienced this is 10 years ago or five years ago, people would say, oh, okay, we did a couple of things. So now let's just hire 30 more salespeople and they're going to start doing the same calls and emails and we're going to get more deals in. That playbook is gone. There is not a single company we advise today where we would recommend that. Although if you go back, look at four years ago, that's exactly the playbook of how Zoom Info grew and Salesloft grew and, uh, and Salesforce grew and all these other companies grew. But that is not the playbook for any company right now where you hire more bodies in order to get more calls and more emails. You don't need, people are no longer subscribing to that. So what's the new playbook? Well, the new playbook is one, instead of focusing on Pros, SDR, AE, marketing, CS as a siloed area, you really are creating, here are the list of our target accounts. Let's together run the right campaigns, run the right programs to get them. Maybe that means you need to bring them to an event. Maybe that means you need to create a special webinar only for 10 people, not 100, but 10 people in that industry, in that category that will bring them to that particular call. Maybe you need to create incredible experiences for them through direct mail or happy hours or whatnot that will bring these conversations to life. That is the new playbook. The, the old playbook where, well, we're just gonna put a bunch of people on the call, it's just not working. So the heroic sales is really killing. And here's the other bad news on that, the companies who do that. Because it is something that has been thought about as the way to grow, people are spending so much money on it. And I've always said companies are not running out of ideas. They're running out of money. And when you run out of money, you run out of time to do that. And it is one of the costliest tests or experiment you can do is to hire a bunch of bodies to do this. So taking a step back from heroics, our advice to most companies is like, all right, if you are in a founder-led sales, now you need to find a way to create this as a go-to-market unit, not just hire an SDR because that's an immediate instinct you get or an AE, but to say, what will, it, what will bring the next 10 customers? Yeah, it was, it was so 15. funny. Yeah. Oh, at the at the event that that we were at, where I don't remember as you or, or a colleague asked the question, um, you know, what does it mean when you've just hired three or four or five salespersons, when, and someone in the crowd said you just got funding? So, <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. yeah congratulations. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so funny. Um, okay. So ne next problem I want to dive into is you want to go up market. But your current customer base is SMB. And I'm curious as to the lens with which you see this. I mean, from from my standpoint, some of the challenges from from going up market is just either you don't know exactly who to talk to or there are multiple people involved in a, in a decision to buy your product. And you kind of got to get both of them. And the org's so big and you just sort of say, I, I don't I don't know what to do. Yeah, well. You know, HubSpot is one of the classic examples for that. Their majority of their customer base is still SMB, and they're a billion-dollar company, multi-billion as a matter of fact, and are fine. And they are trying to go and have a certain segment up market, but the reality is majority, almost 80% or more of their customer base still seems to be SMB, and there's so much written about it. So the question is not that the, the real motive the reason why people want to go, we have to really take a step back, John, on this one. And, and we will ask the question, like, why do you want to go up market? Well, because we think it's going to be bigger deals that will essentially give us better return and they would have longer thing. They'd probably be sticky. And most likely that's what the board is actually asking you to do because that's what they feel is the security for the return on investment. So it is less about customers 
and it's more about the returns and the VC and the, the outcome that people are looking for. And that's where people miss. They, they have the wrong motive. And if you have the wrong motive around that, then your product, if it was created for SMB, go all in. Become the best product for your SMB customers and there's nobody who's coming in and jumping in that. So you go, go for it. But companies very quickly just I go back to the old playbook. Oh, we have sold this for SMB. If we sell one mid-market or one enterprise, that will take care of for 50 SMB customer cost-wise. So let's do it. The mathematically, it makes perfect sense. But if your product is not designed for that, if your messaging is not talking to them, and if your value prop is very much away from that, then you're going to be muddy. And we have this, and you saw the, at the ROI uh, report that we do, where we call this the muddy middle. This is where companies go to die. Literally, it's the muddy middle where you just have an indirect way of showing value and it happens more and more, more because all of a sudden your product and your value prop and your positioning is not talking to the customer who actually cares about that. And that's really important to think about it. So don't go SMB mid-market enterprise. I think that's a question is what is the motive? Why? Why do you need to go there? And that once you answer that question deeply, I think you will find that most companies don't really need to do that. And, but you also need to talk to like different people at companies in in different ways, right? Because um, the, the person that's going to be using their their pro your product, they all they care about mostly is are, can they save time? Yeah, right. And then um, and then you know for 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 their leader, it might be is it on strategy. And for the finance owner, is it is it saving us money? And so it's it's different messages at the right time have have to happen in more sophisticated organizations. At yeah. least that's my experience. Yeah, and the bigger the organization, the bigger the challenge on this one is like, where do we go? And if you have more than one product line, that makes it even worse because mm -hmm. are we taking this product line up market? Are we taking this product line up market? Are we taking the whole platform up market? The question really has to come back to why. Why do we need to go? Are we going to see more success with it? Is the users going to use it more? And there's, again, think about Canonly. Great, another example, Terminus and Canonly. We all grew up in the same Atlanta tech village here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And they made a PLG, PLG move and they grew and amazingly. And now when they reach a particular point, they literally have somebody in the sales. I remember Tope, who's the CEO of Canonly, he did not take any funding as long as he possibly could because every single VC was telling him, hey, you know what, we'll, we'll give you $20 million and then you need to go up market immediately and you need to hire reps and you need to go all this stuff. And he's like, why would I do that? I go to sleep and I wake up and I have 10,000 new customers. Why would I do that? Nobody understood PLG at the time the way he did because it was too early for the marketplace. So we have to be careful about the motive of why certain things need to happen. Okay, third one I want to dive into is um, is one I find really interesting, and that is your analyst relations are weak at best to drive influence. I guess um, I guess I want to approach this from a couple of different areas. First is when when's it important to engage analysts, and then second, what's the outcome? That you're that you're hoping for. Are you, are you hoping for um, a quadrant where your your product's in the top right? Are you hoping for an an analyst to talk to other prospective clients about you? Sort of um sort of why go into it and then and then what's the through line to revenue? Yeah, I think it is one of the hardest one to really dive into for most companies because most companies either have this love-hate relationship with it. Like, I hate analysts. Like, why would I even talk to it? It's a pay-to-play. Like, why, why do we want to do it? But at the same time, there are a whole bunch of, like, IT especially, finance sector especially, where they don't make a decision unless it has been verified by an analyst. So what we started to find in our research, independent of all of it, was it's important to have the relationship if your business depends on RFPs. If RFP is not the reason why somebody's going to buy from you, it doesn't really matter. It really doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, one of the CMOs we're talking to, their, do, their whole department is measured on not inbound, not outbound, not number of pipeline, not revenue, but number of RFPs they get to submit. 
because they know once the RFP comes in, then in the buying process, it's that big of a deal. They need, they got the rubber stamp of approval on it and they can actually go in and multi-year deal is possible. It's a multi-million dollar deal you're doing. So when you do that, that quadrant thing mat matters a lot because at that point, that's really the game you're playing. So you gotta figure out your product is aligned, your analyst uh, messaging is aligned, you're briefing them all the time, you're getting input and making sure you're part of it. And so you have to play that game at that moment. And that really could be the reason why a company at a certain size in particular segment will either live or die. Most companies out there, John, they don't really need it. They really would should care less about that. I mean, great, you're on the cool quadrant. or you're, Nobody really is making buying decisions at that stage in it. So those companies probably shouldn't be forcing uh, themselves in it. This is really for big companies as you scale into specific segments and sectors. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah, because I think... For a lot of a lot of um, companies that are doing new things, oftentimes a, a quadrant hasn't been created. Like, oh, absolutely! Like, I mean, you remember, like at Terminus, we you know we did whole ABM thing, the and and we started in 2015. The first ABM quadrant or wave was created in 2020. <laughs> oh, is that right? That's 2020. Funny. And by that time, there were over 10,000 jobs where people had it. And I mean, it was like, okay, thank you so much. Like it, it, mean, it meant, meant nothing. People already know who was the leader. People already knew who the players were. But the, sometimes it is so slow and so delayed in a category like that. It didn't really make a whole bunch of difference. But there are categories in IT and security where you need that validation because it is the stamp that you're looking for to make sure you're making the right decision. Well, I would encourage everybody listening um, to to instead of uh, worrying about the entirety of, of the sales and marketing funnel and what's going on in your organization to actually go through and, and the, the um, checklist on Sangram's website, GTM Partners, and try to identify the two or three things that are the biggest issues, because that'll help help zero you in on how to solve them. Uh, Sangram, looking ahead to next year. Um, what are you what are you excited about and then yeah. and then what what do you think companies should really focus on given where we are macroeconomically oh man so obviously i cannot not say ai because then nobody's going to like believe we are talking at all in real time um so clearly there there is a tremendous amount of emphasis and rightly so for figuring it out how much manual work we do I think people haven't really realized that. We feel like we are doing podcasts and listening on while you're driving. Oh, we are so tech technology savvy. We, actually, if you really look at it, we're in stone age when it comes to using technology for based on the number of manual things we do. We, we, we write content, we post it, we edit it. There's 80 different things that you and I could do that we shouldn't do today. And there are people on the team, unfortunately, who are doing some of it that they shouldn't be doing. So... I think there is a clear need for proper use of AI to augment all the things that we shouldn't be doing and bring the humanness and the creativeness of human mind out in the marketplace. So what I'm excited about to see in 2024 is to be more human out there in everything companies are doing, not more robotic, rather use robots and AI to do your job better, but being more human in the way you experience brands and the way you, you are actually going to go and do business with. So that's number one. Number two, I'm really, really excited about uh, the idea that companies are going to start figuring it out that the metric is not departmental metric. Like the, the dashboards out there in the marketplace are not going to show how many people visited their website and how many leads they generated. It literally comes down to this one single metric, NRR. And we talked about that at the event where net revenue retention five years ago, I would have never raised my hand and said I'd focus on that. But today... Half the room is saying, yeah, that's my metric. Two years from now, it will be every single person. Every single department has to figure out how NRR is the way you build a healthy company. So that's number two. And number three, this is, this is the part that is both happy and sad at the same time. I think sales is the, is the hardest uh, job in the tech industry. Being an SDR is the hardest job in the tech industry. But there are jobs like that that are going to have a clear hitting a wall moment where, wait a minute, do, do we really need another X number of people to pick up the phone call and send meaningless emails through cadences? We're probably not going to need that. So what is the new structure of a go-to-market team? 
not a marketing sales CS team, but a go-to-market team. What is the new role of go-to-market? Is that a group that comes together that brings all these elements or is there going to be a rise of generalists who can actually do some some uh, some sales and some marketing and some CS work to actually be able to be go to market for a product line? Or is it still going to be as sallow as it has been for the last decade and a half? I think we are going to see a big resurgence on this this whole idea of roles as well as the titles. People have built their careers as a product marketer, as a, as a demand gen person, as a content writer. All of those are going to be up. Uh, for for grabs to figure out, well, do we really need that? Or what do we really need in order to help move the business forward? So this is going to be a whole change in it. So I'm excited to see where that goes. I, I love it. And um, and let me let me end here. When you talked about um, AI and its role and back to what we said at the beginning about how you need uh, you need mindsets, you need dreamers, doers and and drivers. I think I think we're on the same page with this. When we say that it, we need to em- embrace AI, it's not about replacing the doers. In fact, maybe the doers should be figuring out how to leverage how to leverage Amen. AI in the yeah. workplace. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that we're all we're going to see the human element shine and go up to the to the top here because no AI is supposed to help you do your job better, not to replace you. It's to do your job better. And any and everybody who can get on board with that idea like, yeah, I want to do my job better. I want to do my job easier, faster. I want to do and spend more time thinking and figuring out what needs to happen as opposed to actually doing an Excel spreadsheet to chop off certain things in five different ways or create 50 graphics of the same thing with a different photo. Why do that? Like use AI to do that and come up with the most creative, brilliant idea that is going to transform the business. I think that's what we're going to see. The more humanness is going to come out of AI. Sangram, thanks so much for joining me today. Good to see you. John, this was fantastic. Thanks for having me. Did you know that more than 20 million professionals and business owners visit business.com and Business News Daily? Why? It's the best place for resources, advice, and information about how to grow your business. And if your goal is to reach our audience, you should become one of our lead partners, sponsor a section of the site, or sponsor even this podcast. Reach us at business.com slash connect. That's business.com slash connect.